Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to this presentation. Very excited to talk about the regenerative home today. And let me share my screen here. So yeah, just a little bit of background, you know, about me. I'm a bioarchitect, inventor. I design and build sculptural self-sufficient dwellings. I've been teaching courses for over 20 years. Um, the goal is to you know, empower people. And uh, bioarchitecture to me means like the next evolution in architecture itself. Um, we're focusing on the science, the physics, you know, buildings that can heat and cool themselves and process waste, uh, create food, um, you know, give us electricity and security, um, as well as uh, reinforce the living biofield around living organisms. It's very important. <laughs> so there's a lot of science about that and uh, we'll get into that. But uh, I use natural materials, mostly uh, materials-based design and, uh, you know, just try to use what's locally available and follow the cues of indigenous people and um, the vernacular styles. So my company, Earth and Hand Natural Building, I found it in 2002, and uh, that's what we do. Biomimicry, appropriate technology, uh, mixing permaculture and art. So our topic today, the regenerative home. So this is a design that I came up with back in, I think around 2012, after taking a workshop with Earthship Biotecture in New Mexico, which was great. I learned a lot about their systems and, you know, exactly how they design their buildings. I was already quite well versed in passive solar home design, had built dozens of homes already. But, uh, you know, Earthship is like, they're the big company out there doing this. And I wanted to understand um, what it is that they're doing that was working. Um, so after that experience, I took everything that I thought was working and I made one list and I, uh, I threw away the rest. And so I pretty much just uh, redesigned my version of the same type of building, self-sufficient autonomous building. Um, and I called it the regenerative home. Regenerative meaning uh, like sustainable, except for better, because you wouldn't say that your marriage was sustainable, right? <laughs> I mean, sustainable is at a very minimum. Everything in nature is beyond sustainable. It's actually regenerative. So that's well, why we I make a that. point, buddy, of saying the exact same thing. Sustainable is a bunch of the way they've manipulated that word is just a it's a waste of energy. But regenerative, abundant is yeah, good good call. Exactly, and then you get this point where certain words become totally overplayed, and it doesn't mean anything anymore. It got greenwashing, and and so uh, yeah, we're just. Uh, we're out here in a sea of, of BS trying to make some sense and live on earth in a harmonious and uh, peaceful and productive way um, in harmony with the natural systems. So I came up with this design. I first made it just a single uh, room, like basically, you know, three to 400 square feet for one or two people. Uh, but the idea is you can expand on this. You could make it bigger. You could make it smaller if you want to. You could tessellate it sideways. You can make long, skinny buildings similar to Earthships. Um, and really, it's just kind of the regenerative home to me is really a set of principles that we would apply to tweaking this original prototype to fit wherever we want to build it. So it'll be a little bit different in each location. So just keeping that in mind. But yeah, um, let's see. We built this in Southern Colorado <clears throat> over a couple of workshops, a couple of years, and it's still there. So I feel like this building has proven itself structurally over the last, you know, over 10 years. And at this point, I'm, I have some volunteers who are going to go out there and set up some equipment for me. And we'll be getting some thermal 
data and other types of data from the building so we can get more feedback. Um, but I do feel it's uh, structurally safe, although this building is not permitted and probably would have a hard time getting permitted in a lot of different counties in the US due to its internal structure being, uh, it's, it's a 98% Adobe structure. So there's no tires, you know, there's no garbage or cans. It's mostly just rammed earth and Adobe bricks with a ferro cement skin over the top. And uh, the vaulted ceiling and roof is made with what's called the Nubian vault. So it's a very ancient technique. We'll, we'll get into it a little bit more. So um, just wanted to you know, highlight some of how I got to the regenerative home. Of course, I mentioned Earthship in the upper right, you see the simple survival pod, which is the miniature Earthship that I built while I was there in New Mexico with the crew. Um, very interesting design um, overall because of its performance, uh, not too much to my liking aesthetically, <laughs> but it, it definitely proves a point and um, I love it for that reason. Um, before I went to Earthship, I was building homes for people and I did this home for a very good friend of mine in Squim, Washington, that you see in the upper left and lower left, that was a big barn farm. And so this was kind of like the regenerative home prototype version one with, as you see, a wooden roof. Um, so it just shows you that um, you don't have to do a Nubian vault or a vault at all. Um, it can be done with a wooden roof. And this was a, a living roof. So plants and soil up on top. You see the backhoe putting That's soil That's amazing, on actually. I love it. This was one of my larger homes that I built around 1,000 square feet. Cool. And so, yeah, just to highlight, if you're not familiar yet, you know, what the pioneering work of Earthship has given us, because they've been working on systems for quite a while. They're not the only people in the world, obviously. <laughs> we got Nancy and Jack Todd. You got uh, so many different genius designers working with closed loop systems. Um, but basically, the idea is that we reuse the water, we catch water, and we reuse it many times before we let it out of the building. And even then it goes into planters outside of the building. So in this way, uh, we're able to combine also, you know, the processing of waste. We would take the human poop and pee and separate it. And using some of the water that we captured, we would deliver those nutrients underground in cells to botanical cells to the plants that would then turn around and feed us. So some people are kind of skeptical, but this has all been proven uh, time and time again, scientifically that, you know, if you grow um, plants off the ground in the black water greenhouse and you test the food that coming out of there, it's perfectly safe um, and uh, gray water as well. So again, issues with like permitting, but um, it depends on where you build. So in the lower left here, you see the uh, flagship uh, Earthship known as the Phoenix, incredible building with a really huge attached greenhouse. And the basic theme here of this whole talk is, you know, utilizing the attached greenhouse to uh, augment heating as well as cooling of the building because you have uh, hot air coming in and it creates extra uh, expansion of air. You open up the ventilation and, and it can pull cool air in or you can just use the uh, extra glazing, the extra windows to catch sunlight um, in an intentional way and store it in the thermal mass. So you get passive solar performance building that doesn't need any uh, expenditures to heat or cool itself. Um, so that's some of this summary there. Um, you know, I just want to jump in on this because our whole thing is complete decentralized self-reliance off-grid in the most functional way. So what you're talking about, we could probably reduce the amount of solar panels and of energy needs up front that expense significantly on a house like this, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, or completely. Uh, you might have a, a couple of solar panels here and there for like some, uh, you know, un unique little device that's out on the farm or something, but we re really don't need solar panels that much at this point. We might have a couple on the house. Um, even gas, we're eliminating. There's such efficient devices now that we can have all the modern conveniences without even using gas necessarily. Um, and I'll get to the systems. Um, okay. 
But I also want to highlight, um, you know, the other people that inspired me, the work of uh, Anna Edey from Sol Viva. That's something we want to check out. And this is uh, a building that was inspired by her work where you see the attached greenhouse here on the front. Um, here, let me, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. Sorry, guys. Let's see, I know there's a way to actually make this look a little bit better. There we go. That looks better. And, uh, and then also my good friend, Sunray Kelly, who's up in Washington State. And this is one of his buildings. You see, again, an attached greenhouse on the front. So the point I want to make also is that we can have the same systems and the same performance and the same uh, general setup in a lot of different shapes. It could be round, could be square, could be long or not. So um, below on the lower left, you see the uh, glass roof. And this is a technique that I learned from Sunray Kelly, where you can just take old, repurposing old uh, tempered glass panels and shingling them supported by either four by fours, four by sixes, or, or round poles. And you're able to make a very low cost, very functional, very long lasting and durable uh, glass roof that could be used uh, for an attached greenhouse or just to let light in for a carport. This is a carport you see here. Um, and then in the lower right, this was actually my house. It's not the best picture, but I had a house on the Oregon coast for a while and I built just a whole mess of roofs out of these tempered glass panels and was working with also uh, attached greenhouse using uh, a high quality greenhouse plastic. So. Everything I'm talking about, I have a little bit of hands-on experience and um, in some cases a lot, like as in construction and design, um, but I'm also a gardener and into closed loop systems. Uh, back in, uh, I think it was around 2010 or something like that, <laughs> I was assisting with a design team, a design charrette with uh, a local landscape architect who was working on a project they call the looper. And this we see in the upper left here, this is uh, the looper, which was a floating barge uh, designed to have closed loop uh, systems to grow food um, and also process, uh, you know, river water. So this would be floating like in downtown Portland and creating food. So I worked a little bit with that design. And then here you see some That's of the cool. other, thanks. Some of the other examples of some of my design work here. Um, but yeah, so back to the regenerative home. Uh, the reason why I selected the Nubian vault is because it's it really is a tried and true. You see on the lower right, these are uh, Nubian vaults of, I think it's eight or nine layers thick, something like that. These are in Egypt and have been standing for over 3,000 years at minimum, probably much longer in my opinion. Um, and you see, you know, they've stood this test of time without maintenance, without anybody taking care of it or rebuilding it. Uh, those arches are still standing. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, exact shape, uh, working properly with the gravitational forces and um, skill in construction is also important. So I studied with Adobe Alliance um, back in 2001 and learned this technique and have been teaching it uh, on occasion ever since. And I've uh, built a few structures using that. In the upper right, you see this is actually the construction of the regenerative home. Uh, so here we are using the guide wires. That's how it's done. And the lower left here, you see just an example, a little sketch I did to show what it might look like to tessellate multiple regenerative home rooms next to one another to make a bigger dwelling. So with four of them, you'd be up to 1,200 square feet. It'd be pretty common size for most families. Okay, I just wanted to add this slide about the Catalan vaults that I mentioned. Catalan vaults are also known as Guastavino tile vaults, thin tile vaults, or timbral vaults. And it is a technique that uses thin tile bricks um, and adding the layers, several layers. The first layer goes on in a gypsum mortar. It's a fast setting mortar as you see in the upper right hand corner and the subsequent layers go on in a bed of Portland cement. I see this as an appropriate use of Portland cement. 
and these vaults are known to be earthquake proof. They're inc incredibly resilient, um, also very efficient to construct, um, being that they require no formwork, only the strings that you see here. Um, the Guastavino Tile Company made this type of construction uh, more prevalent in the United States around the 1900s, early 1900s. And um, there are tens of thousands of Catalan vaults in the United States due to the Guastavino Tile Company, most of which are still standing. At some point, uh, this type of construction was actually written out of the building codes because the engineering mathematicians couldn't explain in math why they were so strong, even though the very practical proof over time was already evident. So at this point in time in the 2020s, we have the software and the math to show why the Guastavino tile vaults are incredibly strong, also known as thin shell vaults, thin tile vaults. And because the math is catching up with the uh, actual construction, I predict that in the near future, this method will be uh, more prevalently permittable in the building codes. So we hope this will come about sooner than later. Uh, this method is also very popular in Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, um, and continues to be so through the ages. Some of these timbrel vaults or Catalan vaults, they are hundreds of years old and still holding strong. Like I said, they've been through earthquakes, incredibly well-proven method. Um, you see in the lower right, there is a example of a stone masonry vault. This work is by Guerno Minke, a wonderful researcher in the field of earthen building and natural construction out of Germany. And that type of building can be done, but it requires a solid formwork to be built of wood. So this is a lot more materials, it's quite expensive. Um, and it has some advantages. You can use the same form over and over again if it's all at the same site or you wanna truck the formwork from site to site. But I see the Catalan vault or timbrel vault as a superior method because no formwork is required. Um, and it's something that, you know, it is basically the least amount of material for the maximum performance. As it turns out, I'm going to be going to Spain next week to study Catalan vault methods with a master mason there in Barcelona. So I will soon be able to add this to my design and craftsmanship repertoire. And then I just want to, you know, throw some stuff out here. I know we're going to get into some like design consultation and stuff, but this is just my presentation to kind of get you guys you know, excited and entice you with some, some different ideas. And these are just some photos I found on the internet of different things that I felt like are in alignment with uh, the regenerative home principles um, and could be applied. So we could do the same concept of a dwelling just using a timber frame structure or a timber frame, timber frame with uh, straw clay or hemp clay or stones and timber frame, or it could be uh here, the, here they're using just logs here on the side. I thought that was pretty creative. Um, could be very futuristic looking. You see this this home here. Um, this could be achieved um, fairly easily using you know more modern materials. We might have to use a ferro cement or a Catalan vault method that I'll explain in a moment as well. Um, and the lower right, you see there's a company called Biotonomy. They're making these nice stone vaults. So there's a lot of ways we can go about it. Um, and there's a lot of new, very useful and interesting materials like um, the ETFE, as you see in the lower right, this place in England called the Eden Center. It's a giant greenhouse and um, ETFE is becoming more common, more affordable. 
Also the upper right is another building that uses ETFE. It's actually clearer than glass. So it, it's more, it lets in more of the spectrum of light than glass itself. Um, and it's just as tough. It's amazing. It's kind of like a wow. fle flexible plastic, but it's highly resistant I never, to ultraviolet light. I never knew there light. was such a thing. That's yeah. awesome. It, That's really cool. Cause if you actually look at, you know, tomatoes are a perfect example. If you grow them in a greenhouse condition, uh, some of the compounds, lycopene, and other things that are beneficial from a health perspective are much lower, if not absent entirely from plants that are grown outside versus in a greenhouse, just because of the spectrum of light that passes through. So that's, I'd be curious to see how that, that material might address that issue. Exactly. And it is a benefit and we'll get into how we can also use the spectrum of light that the plants don't need as much. We use some of that and we can capture it on the inside of the greenhouse envelope to uh, capture heat as part of the overall power system for the neighborhood or the dwelling. Um, so anyway, yeah, ETFE is great stuff. It's also chemically inert, so it doesn't react with anything. It's highly UV resistant, incredible stuff. And I just threw in a couple other photos of stuff that I feel like is um, inspiring, um, you know, working toward the same principles, um, these upper photos. And then the lower left here, you see the interior shot of what's known as the green powerhouse, which would be some other project we want to get into later at some point and check out the green powerhouse also very interesting project in idaho that uses um it grows uh algae inside of a greenhouse and harvest the algae out of that out the oil out of the algae to burn the oil like uh, diesel fuel um, so anyway there's a lot of possibilities for how to actually create enough heat and light and power um, and I just feel like there's so many and there's so many abundant options and they're affordable that there's no reason why we can't make some moves in this direction and send our investments in that way. So, um, but yeah, the main, my, my main, uh, I guess, hero in the world of uh, power generation would be this uh, friend of mine, his name is Jurgen. Klein Watcher. Uh, I'm going to interview him actually tomorrow morning, but he's an inventor, German guy. He worked with Tamara Solar Eco Village, and um, these are all his inventions here you see on this page, and I think um, some of the system that's, that he's come up with might be the best way to go for a neighborhood scale um, off-grid power generation or uh, even for a single dwelling, and these are combined heat and power generation type machines. So uh, in the upper left and right, you see the solar concentrators that he's invented. These are uh, super lightweight, very thin materials, uh, affordable, um, very simple to use. He designs everything. And, and, and I agree with this. In all of our designs, we should make it so that the end user can maintain and repair it into the future. So it's not like some crazy high tech thing that when it breaks, you know, you need to hire the specialist to fix it and it's very expensive. Very simple stuff. And uh, what you have here is a solar concentrator that, that, or several types here, there's a couple types where it captures heat, it stores it in a heat battery. So the battery is not some complex, <clears throat> you know, um, type of battery. It's very simple. It could be as simple as a box of dirt that's super insulated. So you store the heat in there or there are more advanced versions where they use like or uh, water. Yeah, or water or oil, vegetable oil uh, or thermochemical storage is also another option. But basically you store the heat um, in the daytime and then at nighttime you might use the heat and run a Stirling engine, which you see in the lower right, the Stirling engine will then power the village or the home. Um, an interesting thing about these Stirling engines is they can be run uh, forward and they'll produce uh, power or they can be run in reverse and they'll produce cold. So you also have a refrigerator there, which kind of couples really well with off-grid system because you can refrigerate during the day 
then that part turns on and at nighttime it's running to make power and it produces light. And the other advantage with this particular system, uh, Jurgen calls it the Sun Pulse 500 and it needs water to cool it. So you do need a pretty substantial source of water, but while the machine is running, while it's generating power or cooling, it pumps water as well. Um, so that's something to note. And, and with these solar concentrators, it's also important to note that you can also do things like melt metal and create ceramics, or you, can, you have this 3000 wow. degree laser that you can employ for other purposes as well. So I think this is kind of like the ultimate uh, future of like village scale power. And Jurgen is trying to get this out to investors right now. Uh, we can set up another conversation with him if you guys want to talk to him as well. So um, yeah, and then the other interesting part about it technically is that it, it uses it, what you see in the lower right-hand corner, um, he calls it the envelope power, the envelope powerhouse. <laughs> and so what it is, is the ETFE lets through most of the spectrum, all the light, like I said, all comes through this glazing. And then he has these Fresnel lenses that are light selecting Fresnel lenses that focus the unwanted light for plant growth onto these capillaries filled with vegetable oil. And those capillaries move through at a certain rate to capture the heat and then store it in the, whatever type of heat storage battery you have. So in this system, you're taking all the like ultraviolet rays and things that would generally damage human skin and plant skin, <laughs> if you want to call it that, the plant leaves, you know, they, they grow, the plants grow better without a certain spectrum of the light. So we're using that waste heat from the greenhouse and we're storing it directly in this way into the um, earth battery, which could be, you know, behind the home in the, in the berm, super insulated. And then also in the lower left is another example, another um, type of setup that I mentioned before, where you can actually use a greenhouse to grow algae and then harvest oils out of the algae, which can be burned even in like a car engine. So then some other pictures of some other projects I've done with like vertical farming and just some outdoor garden beds with uh, shower water running underneath. So um, also important to highlight, you know, rainwater catchment. I really am a fan of these systems where we can make a tank of any size we want that's never going to collapse because we just dig a hole, line the hole with the EPDM and felt, and then we fill in the space with these space frame blocks that are these like, you know, BPA free like plastic blocks. So the water sits in, sits in there with the plastic blocks. Um, and one of the advantages to this system is you can actually, they're very strong. You can build buildings on top of it, um, or you can have a road go on top of it. It's quite strong. So you can build a huge water tank underground and still use the space not lose any space um that's fantastic yeah it's it's good stuff or we can also just use the standard tanks but obviously we need to bury some tanks in the earth for this type of system um lower left you see like this is the catch basin from rainwater catchment on an earth ship um upper left you see uh these vacuum evacuated solar tubes as part of a solar hot water system which I think could be a good system. A lot of these systems might seem redundant, but as you know, like in permaculture, we love redundancy. We got backup systems for the backup systems, which means we'd have two backups and it's a good idea. Maybe your main system is more expensive, more robust, and then your backup systems are gonna be smaller and more uh, low cost. Um, and then I just threw in uh, you know, a couple pictures of the end user's experience of this like, kind of like gray water cycling systems, what it looks like when you're inside of a building that's growing food. You got a little hose here, a little garden bed. And then uh, here's your uh, Japanese style, you know, when they flush the toilet. Ideally, you'd flush the toilet with gray water in a regenerative home. But then if you could also have fresh water, if you have an ample supply, come out and then you can wash your hands with it. <laughs> so there's just, there's multiple ways to, uh, to do things. And so, yeah, and then just kind of wanted to just throw out some more images here. I see I've 
I've got some ferro cement, like very sculptural roof here, just to instill the concept that really any shape, any shape we want, we could achieve. Um, so it's just a matter of designing it and engineering it. And um, if we're conservative in the shape, um, you could use things like bricks and do Catalan vault method. And if you want to do something even more sculptural, you would have to use something like ferro cement. Um, the attached greenhouse or the ferro cement. The, I, it, it's important to know these could cause issues with the biofield from the readings that we're getting. Um, some people don't care, but I think it is important. Um, plants grow better and humans grow better when not surrounded by a cage of metal. So anytime you have a grid work of metal, generally that reduces the living biofield. And then just a couple of examples of the technical stuff. We got the water organizing module, the power organizing module. And then on the upper right hand, you see the uh, what's known as a Watson wick, which is my preferred method where you would flush the uh, all the nasties down underground into underwater underground uh, air um, vault established by some uh, plastic barrels, half a plastic barrel you see here right in the middle. This is a top view. There's a little inspection port there. And what happens is with the water, then everything just spreads out level. And, um, and then there's gravel out there and you get organisms that live in the gravel, microorganisms, and they travel in uh, to process those nutrients. And uh, it becomes completely non-pathogenic in no time. And you have like deep rooted plants that will suck that nutrient and moisture up from there. Um, and the lower right, it's important to mention the biogas systems. This could also be something that we want to incorporate. And indeed, they do incorporate the biogas system into the village power systems at Tamara Solar Eco Village and the systems that Jurgen was working on. Are you a fan of home biogas? Um, not particularly. Okay. But I think it's great that they're reaching out to everybody and yeah. making it so that people can just get one and do it, you know, but it just yeah. doesn't seem like a very long lasting type device, the way that they've constructed it. I'm a huge fan of solar cities uh, that, uh, what's his name? The professor up in Seattle, uh, Dr. Colhane, mm -hmm. Thomas Colhane. Yeah, he's doing some great work around the world. And, and so, yeah, yeah. And this biogas would be like your backup systems, you know, it depends on where, what part of the earth you're at, but, um, having some biogas for backup heating to reinforce or reheat your heat battery if there's not enough sun this could be a great idea as well as something like uh, wood gasification um, so and this is my next slide here in the lower right you see a wood gasifier this is a great backup system that they also use at tamara um, that Jurgen also incorporated into his systems. So you would be able to burn things like sawdust or, you know, chunks of wood or wood chips, anything really that's flammable. You could burn garbage. So uh, is that kind of like a uh, rocket mass heater on steroids? <laughs> the way that it uh, burns it? Not exactly. Not exactly. It's, it's similar, but this would be a whole nother level. This, this would what you call pyrolysis where it burns the material in a very low oxygen environment so that you're promoting smoke you're causing like the very thick nasty smoke to come off of it but it's contained then that smoke going into the system is scrubbed and then there's gases there's hydrocarbons in those gases and you can run a car on it you can run a generator on it you can uh, light it as a flame it's similar to biogas there's a lot of hydrogen in there and and uh, carbon monoxide. So you got to You know how much it would cost to put one of those together? Um, there, yeah, and I, I do have a lot more details on all this stuff. I, I've done, you know, like I said, years and years of research and there's companies coming out a lot more recently now where you can actually buy a lot of these things off the shelf. So I think there's a, uh, I forget the name right now, I'd look it up, but there's a company that sells wood gas fires for like a residential scale. Um, I think they're, yeah you know, they're up there. They're, they're not cheap. Thousands, What's up there mean? thousands of dollars. I don't know, maybe like seven grand or something. 10 grand. Oh, okay. Well, the, uh, the alternative, we were working with a guy who did this with his family and his 
smallest unit was a hundred grand. Well, yeah, and you got your backyard builders. I mean, you can you can tinker one of these together yourself if you know how to weld. Uh, this I have never done myself. But yeah. if you see in the upper left-hand corner, here's a mason heater that I built. I built at this point, I built, I don't know, about six different mason reheaters um, and a bunch of rocket mass heaters. And the mason reheater is the traditional like go-to high performance, um, especially with these, you know, high temperature bricks that can store a lot of heat. Yeah. Um, can we and, turn our fireplace? We're building a home at golf signing and have a fireplace in it. Can we turn it into a masonry heater? Um, there's a way you could surround your cast iron fireplace with some thermal mass and kind of transform it a little bit into a masonry yeah. heater. You could do that. I don't usually recommend that. I would say just take that out, sell it and build yourself a proper masonry heater, which is the rocket mass heater on steroids right there. The masonry okay. heater, <clears throat> incredible performance. I mean, your, your wood burning is uh, above 1500, 2000 degrees in that range. And at that, at that temperature, all the material burns. So you have virtually no smoke. You're not getting a lot of emissions into the atmosphere. And you can also run it on very little wood. So if you have a wood lot as part of your homestead, you can actually run these things on just coppiced wood. So you're going to burn like half a cord of wood or less, it's probably way less if you have a regenerative home because the home already heats itself through passive means. So you're only going to burn a fire when maybe the air is really moist and you want to kind of just give your house a little bit extra nice feeling, you know? So, um, Masonry heaters, I think, are a genius invention. They last forever. There's no moving parts. Very easy to maintain if you ever need to change out a brick on the inside after many decades. Um, they're not cheap. Again, probably they're, they're starting at like ten grand. But uh, upper the upper. Well, I'd like here. to reframe that. I'd say that's incredibly cheap relative sure. to the alternative. Exactly. Well, it's how long is it going to last? That's what I'm saying. It's a great investment. Most people yeah, that's how to these. say it. It's yes. a it's an no brainer investment. I couldn't agree more. And I think the only reason most people aren't building these right now in the U.S. is because there's like a cultural, like unfamiliarity, and there's a lot of like speculation economy kind of people moving a lot. They're not sure how long they're going to stay in their current house, that type of thing. It prevents people from making such an investment and saying, well, I'm going to put 10 grand into my wood heating in this house because I'm going to be here the rest of my life. And that's, you that's know what, what I've never seen is, and I'm sure it's out there, but somebody who actually took their system, their mas masonry heater, and then they did the numbers on how much energy input from them that because people think about wood stoves and and they're like oh my god that's a lot of work but not really when you look at the value that it creates it's it's not it's the opposite of a lot of work it's a time saver right yes exactly and you you carry all the bricks it is a lot of work but you do that once and then for the next forever decades you carry one fourth the amount of wood and you chop one fourth the amount of wood into your house. And it's just so much easier because I've had a wood stove, a cast iron wood stove, and it's, it's so much work. <laughs> that is yeah. my primary source of heat. So absolutely. It is, it, it yeah. is some work. <laughs> I would love to surround mine with some, some thermal mass to make it perform better. That's for sure. Yeah. And that may be an intermediate option for a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to highlight this upper design here. This is a, a guy out of Oregon, Walker Stoves, um, who I don't know personally, but I really admire his design because he's managed to really shrink down and make the masonry heater uh, as a cook stove style, mm -hmm. much more compact. So this would be a typical like kind of appliance size box. You see it's next to like, what is this like a... a dishwasher or something right here so it's the same height as your stoves and and it's the same depth as a stove it's a little wider than your typical stove but this thing is a monster i mean it will burn like i said at you know 1800 2000 degrees um heats up really fast you have an oven you have racks multiple racks you have multiple um cooktops um 
So this combined with uh, some of our very modern, uh, very high efficiency electrical induction uh, burners is a complete system because then you have uh, the induction burner for daily use and then this fire powered system if you ever don't have electricity or if you just feel like having a fire. Yeah, and I like seeing the hot water coils you've got there too on the, the stove beneath that. That's really nice. Right, of course. And that's where we're headed also is, uh, you know, combining all these possible features into everything that makes heat that produces waste heat, we would catch that heat and add it back to the heat battery. So we're always keeping that heat battery at, you know, 250 degrees and we can draw from that heat battery whenever we need it, but it's isolated from the house so that, um, you know, when it's hot out, we're not heating our house with it. It's just, whenever we need it, we have power on demand. We've got hot water on demand. You run the, run the clean water tube right through the heat battery at a certain speed. And when it comes out the other end, it's the right temperature. You can mix it with cold water, you know? So little, little tricks like that. And then, uh, what else we got here? Well, that's pretty much it, guys. I really appreciate your time. And this is a fun conversation. I think we're going to get into some fun design charrette here with you pretty soon. I'm so glad you recorded this. Um, can you send us a copy of this? Because when we sell these Freedom Farm Academies, it's the design is the first step. And what we'd like to do is maybe send this We've got two connections with builders. One does steel frame 3D printed construction, which is really valuable and it goes up fast. It's a great product. And then your product, which I think is epic. So we're going to be offering people all these alternatives. And I think showing them this video would really open their minds to what's possible. Definitely. That's a great idea. And also I was thinking about creating like a form you know, because most companies, when, when you want to buy something, they have a form and they're like, you just click the boxes of the things you want. And then, you know, then we spit out the price. So I think that's appropriate. And, uh, you know, part of the reason why I spent so much time talking about the systems is because that's what, that's what makes us comfortable. That's what keeps us alive. And, you know, and the food system is, is priority and the water system as yeah. well. It so, brings it um, together. Yeah. Yeah. And so those, there are so many options about exactly you know, how much food system do you want or how much water system and that you really need to, um, you kind of have to display out the options for somebody. And then I think, you know, work backward from that, like, okay, yeah. what, at what type of systems do we want? And then we can come up with the exact uh, structural element and layout for the home from that. I love it. I love it. I'm glad you got into it too, because now I've got something new to look at. I'm curious about these wood gasifiers, because from what I what I understand, the biogas doesn't perform quite as well in colder climates, but I'm surrounded by plenty of fuel in the form of wood. So that's really cool. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because it, it is a lot of redundancy I'm talking about here, but I could easily, I was working on a project at my homestead that I had in Oregon a while back before I sold that land. And what I imagine is basically placing the biogas digester right on top of the heat battery. So then, you know, it's no extra work. Like the, the, any heat loss you're, you're getting off the heat battery is going into the biogas digester, which needs to be at about 100 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So then you have a super efficiency um, stacking functions and stacking units <laughs> i love that yeah the, the heat battery really brings it all together and i mean heat is like your purest form of energy most people don't think of tapping into that directly to draw electricity or you know have it perform so that's exactly i, I, I definitely see that being i see why you see that as the future of energy because it's simple you know and, and the closer you get to basics and simple truths simple elements like that I think the closer you get toward what is meant to be, you know, what the optimal condition is. So, yeah, I love that. Exactly. Yeah. And another thing to note is that insulation is like a machine, only again, no moving parts, you know, so you can have a box with 10 feet of insulation on all sides. There's nothing that says you can't have more insulation. So 
the more insulation you add and the more tight it is, the better it holds it in. So it's a very efficient uh, way to go about things is it using super insulated heat battery. But um, actually, I think the future of energy is way beyond where we're at now. And there are some uh, devices that are now available commercially. I think I sent you guys some examples already on email, but um, you know, people kind of shy away from the topic of zero point energy and so on. But I think that that is in the works. I heard about a, some guys who are producing a Tesla turbine that will be for sale this year that is producing over Unity. Um, and then there are a number of other systems. I've heard up to 12 or 15 different, totally different devices that are already completely proven to produce over Unity. Um, so it's just a matter of time where we can just get our hands on these things and we can add that into the mix. And, but I think it's important for us to take action now because we can't just sit around and wait for that, you know, those things to come out. You know, that's exactly why I said what I said because yeah, I've been following Zero Point for a while as well, and it's just like I, I want to see a system that works. You know, show show me what I, I need to see it. I need to see it in action because I I believe it's possible totally, but I, I don't want to believe. You know, I want to know. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I forgot it. Nice. I want to stop the share there. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think magnetics is really, you know, it seems like that's the golden ticket in a lot of ways. We get to that point of understanding how that, like you guys, I've seen examples and it seems like it's, it's there, but it gets squashed or whatever happens. Oh yeah. I mean, there's several, there's, like I said, more than a few, you got uh, works of uh, Tom Bearden, uh, Victor Schauberger, um, there's a guy that is a teacher of mine right now, Mr. Dan Winter, who I'm going to go visit this month in France. And um, he's pretty uh, humble for how genius he is as a physicist, but he's come up with an equation that's essentially Planck, which if you're familiar with physics, Planck's constant times the golden ratio. And what you end up with is like this golden ratio cascade and it's it's not just any series of numbers it is like the series of numbers in the world and you find it repeated in so many things like the uh, molecules of hydrogen like they exhibit the same like spatial relationship to this cascade of numbers also um, gravity itself so he believes that he's come up with basically the first really viable explanation for what is gravity. And if we can understand what is gravity, which he says is essentially just charge rotated, and we can create our own gravity, you know, and with this and the same technology is the same concept and understanding of the world. If we understand the physics, we can actually create energy or create gravity. And it's not like it's just free energy from nothing. It, it comes from like the vacuum, the toroidal like implosion of the power yeah. that's happening all around us and then when you use the energy comes through and then it goes out as a longitudinal wave out into the universe so once you understand how that works you can apply the inverse relationship of it right create anti-gravity or a repelling force so exactly exactly and i think that also those magnets they do have something special and they are related to gravity and when we understand gravity, we'll understand magnets. And it's kind of just, mm. it's all right there for us. And it also it ties in with health and consciousness. So anyway, if you get a chance to check out Dan Winter on YouTube, I think you'll be- Yeah, I was gonna pleased. say, I'm pretty sure he did uh, a higher side chat with Greg Carlwood uh, sometime back. I, I remember hearing Dan Winter and really liking what he was about. So that's, that's pretty cool. You get a better product when you spend more time and more attention on the design. It's like the the end product is your attention materialized you know, architecture is like it's like frozen music you know and the music is us cool thanks scott thank you guys have a good one take care See you. have a great weekend take care all right um,